My name is Brian Leander. I'm a faculty member here at UBC in zoology and botany, and I help run the marine invertebrates part of the museum. So I was asked to come and uh, basically discuss anything I wanted to that sort of gave the visitors of today some sense for what the marine invertebrates collection is all about. So I chose uh, the concept of eversibility, and this is what this means is the ability to turn oneself inside out, like this umbrella has done. So there are lots of different organisms on planet Earth, and they're all trying to survive. And there are fundamental problems that many different lineages have solved in different ways in order to get food or to prevent something else from making you food. So defending yourself or being the offensive player. One of the best ways to do that is to reach out and touch someone. Sometimes that's done very aggressively. Sometimes it's done very gently. I'm going to show you a variety of different organisms across the tree of life that can reach out and touch someone in novel ways, very different than we do with our hands, and mainly. So the first thing is I want to just introduce you to this term, invertebrates. It's a horrible word, in my opinion. Basically, it refers to every single animal on the planet except one little lineage called vertebrata, and those are animals that have backbones. So human beings have backbones. They've decided that's important. So they said, okay, we have vertebrates here, and everything else we're just going to lump together. And they're invertebrates. So most of the amazing drama and action and beauty on planet Earth is actually in a tree of animal life that is involved in various kinds of invertebrates. And there's a few examples here. So we're going to touch on these throughout the talk, and I'll just point out that the vast majority of specimens we have here have to do with dead invertebrates, and the best way to have a dead invertebrate is something that secretes hard parts that per, they use to protect themselves. So we have a variety of different kinds of shells and tests and exoskeletons of various kinds and endoskeletons that basically are secreted by different animals that span the tree of animals. Um, and one of the things we want to have as a framework to try to understand what I'm about to show you is who's related to who and why. So the tree of life is very, very important. And the best metaphorical tree of life I've ever seen that human beings have made is in the dead center of the animal kingdom in Orlando. And that's right here, the tree of life. And there's an amazing attraction at the base of this. But basically what I want to give you the sense of is that every single one of these green leaves represents a tip or a species. And every single one of those things, whether it's you or a bacterium, or whale is related to one another at some level in the hierarchy. So think of this bush, and we're going to look at some of the faces, some of the players, the cast members of this beautiful movie called Evolutionary History. So one of the most powerful ways to understand who's related to who is to look at a bit of morphology that is extremely tiny, and that is the DNA. This is the recipes that make everything the way they are. So every single cell of a multicellular animal is going to have the exact same instructions to build that animal. Or if you're a single cell animal, you'll have the exact same instructions. Well, you have the instructions to build who you are. So we have DNA then that you can compare over vast distances. So you can compare a bacterium with a human, for instance, by looking at DNA. So it's a very powerful way for understanding who's related to who. You can look at just strings of bases, or you can look at specific kinds of genes that are shared between different kinds of organisms. But it basically what we'll, this is demonstrated is that you have three major lineages or domains of life. You have little tiny things, which are the true single-celled organisms, bacteria and archaea, and then you have these complex, very sloppy systems called eukaryotes. And this is actually going to be the group of animals that you're most familiar with. So we are eukaryotes, animals and plants are eukaryotes that we see on a daily basis. They're in our face. They're large, they're thriving at the same scale that we thrive in. If you look inside their cells, it's actually a very complex system of things. So you have this big nucleus where the DNA is found. You have all these membranes that are doing various kinds of things to get the DNA encoded into some structural thing, like a protein. And then embedded inside these cells, you have additional cells called mitochondria, say in an animal and plant cell, these orange bodies, or these things called chloroplasts, which do the business of taking sunlight and converting it into sugar. These things have their own genomes, their own DNA. 
they are actually organisms that are living symbiotically within a eukaryote. So a eukaryote is actually a composite of many different lineages that have come together. It's a much more complex cell, and some eukaryotes become multicellular and trillions of cells. So we normally categorize the world as animals and plants. So we have zoology departments and botany departments. Go back to Aristotle, you have the animalian, the vegetable, what something, vegeta, vegetable something. And we have uh, nomenclatural systems in science that are focused on animals and plants. It turns out that the vast majority of eukaryotes in this picture are neither plant nor animal. They're microbial eukaryotes, and they're thriving in this water. They're thriving in this landscape here, thriving in and around all these trees. So back in the 60s, it was very popular to sort of begin to appreciate that diversity. Fungi were then separated from plants as a different group, like mushrooms. And then we had everything else, kind of like invertebrates, just thrown into this grab bag of things. They're microbial carrots of one kind or another. We'll call them a protist. Now, with the advent of DNA, especially, and more sophisticated techniques for understanding morphology, this is what the framework looks like today. So here's the tree of eukaryotes. Animals is this little lineage here. Plants, land plants are right up here. You have fungi and this little part of the tree there. You have all these other things that are also eukaryotes, but they're thriving at the microbial level. They're outside of our ordinary realm of experiences. You need technologies to perceive them. So I'm going to show you some of these things before we kick into the invertebrates especially, which are going to be in this part of the tree, animals. But before I do that, I want to just come back to the thing I'm trying to talk about, which is the phenomenon of eversion, or turning yourself inside out. So basically, for, for some of you, basically, what I'm saying is here's an appendage that's sticking out. It's a part of the anatomy of an animal or the entire organism doing this and making the outside become the inside and making the old inside now the outside. So this has been done multiple times across the tree of life. And I want to contrast that now to other ways of reaching out, like extension, like I extend my arm. So here's an example of extension in the microbial world. So this is a eukaryote. It's thriving out here in our backyard. This was collected off of... Uh, just off of Orcas Island in the, in the uh, San Juan Islands off of Washington. This is a, a little eukaryote here, and it has this long appendage called a piston, and it has spasmonemes in there that can contract rapidly, and when they relax, it extends. So we don't even really know what this is doing, but it's an example of an extension or extensive way of reaching out. Now, if we go into some multicellular things, here's another extensible appendage here. This is something called a flatworm. What's interesting about them is their feeding apparatus and their mouth and their anus is the same hole. So there's only one opening into their body, and it comes out right where, you, right where your belly button comes out. So if you look at these flatworms, they, and you stain for their muscles, there's musculature going in every variety of, well, all sorts of directions. And this gives them a huge range of behavior associated with locomotion and feeding. A lot of the muscles are accumulating right here. And that is the pharynx. This is the part of the animal that they're going to use to reach out and catch food and get it into their body. So here's a, an extensible muscular pharynx coming out of the belly button area of this animal. So that's extension. That is not eversion. So let's talk about eversible things. And we can actually go through the entire tree. We can talk about bacteria, we think. We can talk about a variety of groups of single-celled eukaryotes, and then I'm going to end by focusing on animals, because that's where you really see a lot of examples of eversive anatomies. So let's start out with bacteria. This is actually a eukaryote. It's found right here in British Columbia, actually in the sands of Boundary Bay. There's a little black, dark layer, so low oxygen environments. On its surface, there are a whole bunch of little things that fire out like threads. Here's a little line of balls. These are organisms that are living on the outside of this larger eukaryotic cell. All these rods are bacteria. These spheres are also bacteria. But notice that these spheres are shooting out threads out of a little pore. And basically what they're doing, if you look at them at high resolution with electrons, you look at the interior, you can see that there's these tightly wound threads inside each of these balls. And some of them completely eviscerate or evert their entire contents out through that pore. Well, they all do eventually. So what we've noticed is that these bacteria 
have the ability to take their DNA, which is localized right here in this dark spot, and just blast the entire contents of that cell out into the environment, probably hoping to land on another host that happens to be in the nearby area if the host thereon is about to die. So that is a potential example of irreversibility within a bacterial cell. Things are going to be a little bit more simple to think about if we look at eukaryotes now. They have a true nucleus with all their DNA in there. Here's something called a microsporidian. Now these are highly streamlined, sophisticated parasites found in just about every group of animals that have been looked at, mainly in insects, but also in immunocompromised patients, human beings. And they're going to be intracellular parasites. They're going to use an apparatus to penetrate the cell of its host and get its entire body inside the cell of its host. And they're going to do that with something called a polar filament here. And the concept of blasting into a new cell with a polar filament is a beautiful example of irreversibility. Here's that tightly round thread before discharge, and it's coiled up inside the spore. And here's the nucleus back here, and there's this big vacuole that's going to increase dramatically in size and essentially push out that thread in lightning speed. And what we call this cellular gymnastics because the entire cell is essentially going to invert itself into this tube and the entire contents of the cell is going to fast through this tube, eventually squirt out the tip and into the new host cell. So this is very similar to taking a rubber glove like this, have some air in it, And if I invert this finger like this, whoops, let me get it in there a little bit better. If I invert this finger like this, that is the resting spore phase. When it's about ready to penetrate a host cell, there is osmotic changes in that vacuole in the back that, in, that creates swelling, and it's going to force that finger straight out. So now the outside was the old inside of the tube in the resting stage. Now, who, at first we had no idea who microsporidia were related to. They were so streamlined and so sophisticated as parasites, they lost all features that would indicate who on the tree of life they belong. So what you used was DNA, and this is recent information. Turns out that the nearest relatives of microsporidian are fungi. So things like mushrooms, things that cause athlete's foot, are the closest relatives to microsporidia. Now, if we look at something else called helicosporidian, they're doing something slightly different, but they are blasting out a tube. But this is more spring-like. Have everyone, has anyone ever used the toy, a snake in a can, where someone hands you a can of peanuts, you open it up, and boom, a snake flies in your face? A spring. That is what's going on in helicosporidian. So you have this spore here. You can see some, something coiled up in there and the spore wall will dehiss, and this filament will blast out at rapid speed and it'll attach to the host cells of insects. So insects are their major host. And it turns out we had no idea who these were related to because they're so streamlined. They aren't photosynthetic, can't be plants, right? Well, the DNA shows that they are. They're most closely related to plants, green algae, and land plants. So you have sophisticated single-cell parasites that have these projectile threads within this group of animals, that, or group of organisms we would call green algae plus land plants. And here's one more example, and I'll end with the unicellular you, eukaryotes here, mixozoans. Here's a variety of different ones here. And you'll see that you have these st spore structures, and they attach into the gills of fish. So they're parasites of fish. Inside here, you have a tightly wound thread and a polar filament. And this thread will evert rapidly, just like I showed you in that microsporidia. These, we had no idea who they were related to for a very long time, and now we see that their closest relatives are animals. So if you were to look across the tree of life, what we're seeing is that you have these very similar modes of life, these single-celled intracellular parasites that use this polar thread technology to blast into their host cells, showing up at least three times independently, once in f near fungi, once near plants, and once near animals. So there is one fundamental distinction that I want to make here is that these are entire cells doing the business of eversion, or this not so much. This is actually an organelle. So there are two organelles that are going to evert. That's a smaller component of the cell. It's not the entire cell. It's a part of the cell. 
And it turns out that our closest relatives within Animalia turn out to be cnidarians. So cnidarians are sea anemones, jellyfish, and relatives. So has anyone ever touched the tentacle of a sea anemone? And what did it feel like? Was it all sticky? Did it feel sticky? There's something going on. That stickiness is going to be the way with which cnidarians, like this anemone, catch food to eat. So for instance, this anemone is reaching out with its tentacles to catch this starfish and then it's going to consume the starfish. So the stickiness of tentacles is a feature that cnidarians share with each other. Here's a little medusa. It's got all these tentacles full of little sticky things inside. Here's another. This is actually a superorganism. It's a bunch of what you would consider a polyp coming together as a mass, and different polyps being specialized for slightly different functions. And all these long tentacles are going to be loaded with little sticky structures. Here's another jellyfish. All these tentacles are going to be used to capture food. So why were these guys so afraid of jellyfish, cnidarians? It's because they're equipped with these little harpoons called nematocysts that can release a very potent toxin when they penetrate your body or your skin. Now, when you touch that anemone, your skin is so thick that these little things bombarding your skin didn't feel very powerful because you can protect yourself with thick skin. Some of these jellyfish, though, can penetrate even your skin. So these things that are embedded in the tissues of the tentacles, called nematocysts, actually do the business of eversion at lightning speed, one of the fastest processes that exist in organisms that we know of. So you have this thread, just like the finger I pushed into that glove, that is going to fire out rapidly and penetrate the cells of what would be a predator or potentially a prey item. So here's a bunch of barbs. So here's a discharged nematocyst. Here's the thread now that's completely everted. Here's a bunch of barbs that are actually going to be penetrated into the skin. Just a little movie to give you a sense for how this is happening. This is an inverted thread that when it everts, the first part is equipped with barbs and anchors securely into the tissue. And then the thread can be released deep inside the cell, release toxins that can essentially paralyze the prey. Because the last thing a cnidarian wants, because it's very soft body, is the prey to just thrash around, because it'll disrupt and destroy its own body. So neurotoxins are very, very common in cnidarians, and they're discharged through these irreversible nematocysts. They're so powerful in the biological world that there are things that steal the nematocysts from cnidarians and use them for their own benefit. This is something called a nudibranch, which means naked gill. It's related to snails and octopuses. And what you see is a whole system of what are called serrata, or little finger-like projections off its dorsal side, or backside. And branches of the digestive tract reach into each one of these things. So you can see the brown part bits. That's its guts. What they'll do is they thrive on eating sea anemones. And they'll eat the sea anemones, and rather being bombarded by the nematocysts, they'll wrap those nematocysts up in a ball of mucus before they're discharged. They'll bring them into the mouth. They'll push those through the branches of the gut, and they'll localize them at the very tips of all of these little things called serrata. So the white tips are loaded with the nematocysts that it's stolen from its anemone food. So kleptoneedy means to steal, like a kleptomaniac. The needy, which one example is a nematocyst from its food. So here you have a, a nudibranch which doesn't have a shell protecting its soft bodies with the nematocyst of the food it's eaten. So here's, let's just go through animals now because animals are really fascinating for us because we are animals and we relate more directly to animals. They have parts that we have, except invertebrates are going to break a lot of rules here. Here's something called a segmented worm or a polychaete. It's crawling around. It's a hunter and it's going to hunt for food in its environment. They're living in the ocean. The head is under here. If you were to flip this over and look at its belly side, where the head is, you notice this slit here? This is a polychaete smiling at you, basically. So when I smile, I go side to side. When a polychaete smiles, it goes 90 degrees up and down. But notice that the tissues are kind of working its way into this slit. What's underneath this mouth is something that has been inverted and is in position to be rapidly everted or turned inside out. So here is the mouth totally distended and the intermediate stage of this big muscular pharynx in the process of coming out of that mouth. If you look a little further down the line, 
here's that massive pharynx full of muscles that have been turned inside out, and now you have these nasty jaws at the tip that are ready to grip the food it's pursuing. Or it's ready to grip your finger if you're just trying to disturb it. So it's a very powerful thing. In fact, these are the hard parts that polychaetes make that show up in the fossil record. You can actually interpret their history. Is that cool or what? Scary, though. Yeah. yeah. So here's what it would look like if it was chasing you, right? Here are those jaws coming right at you. This one's actually found in deep, deep ocean environments. Let's look at a different group. There's a totally different lineage of animals now called nemertians or ribbon worms. They're these long ribbons. They have amazing elasticity. You can just take one of these and just pull and pull and pull and pull, and they seem to never break. They have two ends that you can't even really distinguish what's the head and what's the tail. But this is the head. So if you look closely at the head, there's actually two major holes in the head. You have a mouth, but you also have a very special hole. And what I want to point out in this schematic is that the mouth would be associated with the digester tract. So two holes, a mouth and an anus and a tube in between. That is where the pharynx of that segment of worm comes blasting out. Up here, you have a whole different system, brand new innovation, brand new thing that Nemertians have come up with that I've shown in orange. What you have is an inverted tube that's just resting there, ready to be turned inside out and blast out of this different hole near the head and reach out and touch someone. They're also predators. So this is a transparent Nemertian. It's weird looking, but it's transparent, just so I can show you that the branching, the brown stuff here is the gut. This white translucent thing in the back, that's the proboscis apparatus. Proboscis means no long nose or trunk, like an elephant has a proboscis. Ribbon worms also have a proboscis. And I want to show you what a proboscis looks like when it is doing its thing. So let's do this here. So check out this Nemertian. It's sitting on the hand of someone who's found it. And he's going to touch it on the end, and the proboscis will completely turn inside out. And it extends the entire length of the animal, in fact, sometimes longer than the animal when it's actually reaching out. So let's just show that in action. So it's a very dramatic way of catching food. And they'll use that proboscis in the terrestrial environment to actually push along, but also to entangle another worm and bring it toward the mouth so it can eat it. OK, so let's look at the proboscis. So here we have that simple one that was just reaching out. It looked like a little worm within a worm. You also have a very kind of sticky, brush-like proboscis. Or you can have these complexly branched proboscis. So you have a variety of different ways of having a proboscis. The unifying feature, though, is the having the proboscis itself. So lots of diversity. Some of them have little stylets at the tip with venom, little neurotoxins to paralyze their food. We're going to move on to another one now. This is called peanut worms. They look like a little peanut. Cypunculids is the fancy way of calling them. They are very common in our backyard. At low tide, go out, turn around some rocks. If you do that, make sure you put the rocks right back where you found them. But you can go deep into the rocks in the intertidal zone, and you're going to find little water balloons with a leathery coat called peanut worms. And they have an amazing ability to feed through the ability to turn themselves inside out. So this looks like a little unshelled peanut, right? At this tip, you have a little pore. And the entire anterior or head end of this animal has been inverted, and it's now sitting inside this major trunk, that little pore. So the way they're going to reach out and find food is through something called an introvert. And this is the entire animal inverting itself, not a part of it like the proboscis apparatus, not a part of it like the pharynx. It's the entire animal turning inside out. So what I want to show you is that in action. So here's another movie. It gives you a sense for how the introvert does its thing. So it's a very graceful, very mesmerizing, very gentle type of turning itself inside out. So you can see as it elongates, the, the animal is just continuously turning inside out. You get tentacles at the tip, and then it's going to bring everything back in when it wants to protect itself. So as you're digging for it in the intertidal zone, as it's, when it senses you getting close, it's going to just drive that introvert back into its body for protection. And it uses its big hydrostatic, well, fluid-filled trunk to wedge itself tightly into rocks. So let's look at that just a little bit more. That is the introvert of a peanut worm, in this case, everting. And then in just a few moments, it'll come back and it'll invert. 
And you can just watch that, or I can at least watch that all day long. I just think it's so cool. So we have introverts now and peanut worms. Here is it fully extended. And basically these are called selective deposit feeders, which means they're going to use these tentacles to reach out and just hand pick the organic materials in their environment that they want to bring into their mouth. Okay, we'll end with starfish and relatives. These are in a group called echinoderms, which means spiny skin. We are the mecca of echinoderm diversity here in British Columbia. We have the most diverse echinoderm fauna basically anywhere on planet Earth. And they're going to have irreversible parts, parts that they can use to turn inside out. Here is the mouth. So we're, we're basically taking an echinoderm, turned it upside down. Dead center, you're going to find the area that food is withdrawn or drawn into. What they're going to do is completely evert the inside of their stomach outside that mouth to reach into the food they're trying to eat. So here's the stomach that has basically been turned inside out through the mouth. It's called extracorporeal digestion, the out-of-body experience. And the reason they do that is they can wedge those stomachs right in between the two valves of a clam or a, or a muscle and basically excrete enzymes and turn that muscle into a soup, basically you know, eat the clam from the inside out. So here is a sun star, which is a major predator in the ocean, going after a clam. Though This is a classic experiment. You always put a sun star in a tank with something else and see what happens. But what ultimately will happen is that sun star will wear out the clam, get its cardiac, well, its stomach into those shells and win the battle here. So here's the last thing I want to talk about in terms of reversible anatomies. It has to do with sea cucumbers. These are closely related to starfish. They're long and skinny. They wedge themselves into the tiniest little crevices, all a lot like a peanut worm. In fact, they're found in the same environments as peanut worms. And they use these tentacles to, to, to basically collect particles suspended in the seawater, and the mouth is dead center. But many of them uh, actually crawl around outside of these crevices. This is another transparent one because I just want to show you this tube within a tube construction. You have a mouth, you have an anus. Here's the digestive tract in there. And what's going to happen is that these sea cucumbers are going to be able to evert their innards to the outside world. So for instance, here is a big sea cucumber called Parastichibus californicus. If we look at the interior anatomy, I want to just point out to you guys that they breathe through their anus. The anus is where the action is. So here's the anus over here. They have these massive branches off of the rectal area that allow seawater in inflate, and then seawater is pushed out. And that is the way they're going to breathe. So the mouth looks like this. They just drive sediment right in, just like an earthworm would. And here's the anus. That's where all the action is. In fact, it's such a great place that lots of animals have used the anus of a sea cucumber for their own survival. They make their homes there. For instance, this is a fish, a pearl fish, who's reaching out, looking around, and then it'll bop back into the anus of the sea cucumber. And there are different species of pearl fish that actually fight over the anuses of certain sea cucumbers. So they'll come up to the sea cucumber, they'll make a little knocking noise, boom, doo -doo, boom, boom, see if anyone's home. If the knocking pattern does not correspond to the species that's in here, that species will come out and a fight will ensue. If the knocking pattern is consistent with the species that's in there, they'll mate. So here we have breathing in action. So multiple inhalations and then one big exhalation. So this is a great place to make a living. You have fresh seawater coming in all the time. You're protected by the sea cucumber. But if a sea cucumber is threatened, what it'll do is completely eviscerate the respiratory trees and the hindgut. So this is what's happened. Someone has taken the sea cucumber and massaged it. And what you're seeing is the complete evisceration of that gut. And this is basically the respiratory trees turning inside out and then exuding out. This massive tissue will just hang out. It'll distract what would have been a nasty predator, and then the sea cucumber can slowly creep away and wedge itself into a crack, maybe. So this is a defensive mechanism to prevent from being eaten. So in tropical species, we actually have new structures that show up in addition to the respiratory trees called cuvarian tubules. They're highly, they're nasty. They're full of nasty chemicals. So it's another way to defend their bodies from something that wants to eat them. So then they'll slowly but surely rebuild their inside anatomy after they've escaped from that predator. OK, so that's where I want to end. I just hopefully I gave you a sense for invertebrates, a variety of different ways that animals, invertebrates mainly, have figured out how to turn their bodies inside out in order to either catch food or 
protect themselves from being food. So have a great Mother's Day. <laughs>